it said that the safest place to be in the world is um, definitely Copenhagen is a safe place, but especially when you're in the association of devotees. When we come together like this and we spend time to hear about Krishna, to sing about Krishna, then it creates a bubble, it said. It said that at least for this time being, when we are together, then all fears, all envy, all worries and anxiety disappears. And uh, we again connect with the real essence of life. Sometimes in life we miss the essence and therefore to come together like this, together we remember the essence. Once there was a king and he was uh, going through the forest and he got thirsty. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't Pariksit. <laughs> it was another king. And he entered the hermitage of a sage in the forest. And so the sage uh, welcomed the king he wasn't in trance at this point, so he welcomed the king and he offered him some water and a seat. He said, even if you don't have anything, you should welcome by at least offering a seat, offering some kind words and giving some water. That, that doesn't cost. Well, nowadays water costs something. <laughs> they say you can know the progression of Kali Yuga because Kali Yuga is progressing when first you have to buy food. In ancient civilization, there was no concept of buying food. Food was available. Food grows on the trees. Why do you have to buy it? So Kali Yuga progresses when you have to buy food. Kali Yuga, you can understand, has progressed even more when you have to buy water. Does it happen now? Yes. And Kali Yuga, you'll understand, has progressed even more when you have to buy air. And believe it or not, that is happening now uh, in certain parts of the world. So, but previously at that time to give water, so he gave some water. And then the king asked the sage, he said, who are you? The sage thought for a moment and he looked back at the king and he said, I'm a king. <laughs> so the king looked at him and was like, if you've achieved some position in the world and someone else claims to have that position, like, a little like are you sure you have that so he looked at the sage and he said you're a king the sage said yes I'm a king the king looked at him and he said if you're a king then where's your armies and the sage closed his eyes and he quoted a verse Didikshava karunika surida sarvadehinam Ajata Shatrava Shanta Sadava Sadubhushana. He looked back at the king and he said, Where's my army? Ajata Shatru. I don't have any enemies. Therefore, I don't need an army. The king said, Wow, good answer. <laughs> and then the king looked at him and he said, If you're a king, where's your treasury? And the sage closed his eyes and he quoted a verse. Santushta Shatatam Yogi Yatatma Dridanishaya. He said, the yogis are completely satisfied. They're completely fulfilled in their hearts. They say that the richest person is not the one who has the most, but the one who needs the least. So he said, I don't need a treasury because I'm already fulfilled within. He said, Wow. He said, if you're a king, where's your kingdom? The sage closed his eyes. He quoted a verse. Tani sarvani samyamya yukta ashita matparaha. He said, the yogis, by engaging in devotional service, have completely controlled and conquered their mind and senses. He said, I've completely conquered my mind. And therefore, for me to rest in my own consciousness is the most amazing feeling in the world. I don't need to live anywhere else because my consciousness has become so purified with no uh, attacks from the mind that is the completely uh, peaceful and sanctified place to rest. Therefore, I don't need any other kingdom to rest. I'm resting in the beauty of my own consciousness. Wow. 
king said, oh, yes, you've got good answers. <laughs> and then the king looked at him and he said, if you're a king, where's your wife, where's your queen? Every king has a queen. Then he sage closed his eyes and he quoted another verse. Madeka bandhu mad sangin mad guru man mahadhana man nishtaraka mad bhagya mad ananda namo stute. It's an ancient verse by Sanatana Goswami who prays that the Bhagavatam is my constant companion. He said, I don't have a queen because I'm married to the Bhagavatam. And the Bhagavatam is Mat Sangin, my constant companion through life. And therefore, I already have the most royal partner I could desire in my life. Wow. In this way, every time the king asked a question, the sage answered. And the king came to realize that every single thing which he had achieved in his life was actually a sign of what was lacking within him. The very things that the king felt were his sign of success. He realized by the answers of the yogi that those were the things that he had pursued to fill up a deeper vacuum that was in within. And in that way, the king realized, yes, you are actually the real king. Um, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's interesting that sometimes renunciates are called Maharaj. Um, when I accepted the order of sannyas, I was given the order of sannyas. Then Pallad Nanda Maharaj said to me, now you are Maharaj. Just make sure you don't become the king of the Maha, <laughs> Maha Prashad. <laughs> Should actually become the king of the senses and the mind. So yeah, they have conquered those who are truly um, worthy of that title. So like this, we're realizing what's really of value. In life, we try to pursue so many things. So we always go back to the Gita. And the Gita, as we merge into the Gita, it takes us to that which is really of value. Um, it's said that thousands and thousands of eons ago, the Ganga appeared in the universe because Vamandev had pierced the hole. And therefore, the causal waters washed the lotus feet of the Lord and then entered into this world as Ganges, Ganga. So therefore, it was said that if you bathe in the Ganga, then the flow of the Ganga will take you all the way back to the lotus feet of the Lord. But then the commentators say later on in Dwapara Yuga, that same Ganges water flowed from the mouth of Krishna when he spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjun. And therefore, whoever bathes their mind and consciousness in the words of the Gita, the flow of the words of the Gita will take you back to the smiling face of Krishna. And then the commentators say, in Kali Yuga, the Ganga doesn't just flow from the Lord's lotus feet. The Ganga doesn't just flow from the Lord's lotus mouth, but the Ganga flows from the lotus eyes of the Lord because Krishna in this age comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and when he chants Harinam Sankirtan, then tears of joy are streaming from his eyes. And that is said to be non-different from the flow of the Ganga. And so in this age, you shouldn't, you definitely you should bathe in the Ganga. Definitely you should bathe in the uh, words of the Gita. But if you bathe in love, in the Harinam Sankirtan, the Prema Kirtan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then by bathing in that Kirtan, you also come face to face with the Lord. So like this, the Bhagavad Gita is given for us, not just to study, but we have to try to enter into the flow of the Bhagavad Gita. We have to walk with the words of the Gita. 
uh, we have to instill these words in our heart. Uh, that is why um, Krishna gave us um, these beautiful uh, verses contained in the Gita. So you can repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Vasudev is a beautiful name of Krishna. Uh, it has many, many different meanings, but one of the meanings is the Lord who is pervading everything. Vasudev means to pervade everything. And therefore, when we're chanting this name of Krishna, then what we're trying to remember is that Krishna, the Lord, divinity is everywhere in all times, places and circumstances. A lower type of religion is when we think that the Lord is in a certain place, in a cer at a certain time, in a certain situation. But the more advanced type of spirituality is we understand that Krishna is everywhere at all times. Krishna is active and attentive and involved in the life of a devotee. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yo maam pasyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pasyati dasya ham na pranasya me sacha me na pranasyati For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. And so in this way, um, when we chant this name of Krishna, we're praying that we may become uh, able to feel the presence of Krishna at all times, place and circumstances. So uh, let us read from uh, somewhere in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, anyone have any particular verse? Or shall I just choose one? Two, who said that? 270, okay. Desire is fulfilled. <laughs> Do you have to give class on this later on or something? We'll <laughs> try and get some ideas. <laughs> okay. So this is a very beautiful verse. Um, 270. So just so you know the context, it's important to know the context of every verse. Because uh, when you understand the context, then you can get more from the verse. So the context of the end of the second chapter is that in the second chapter, Krishna is basically doing what? What's the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita called? The contents, of the Gita. contents of the Gita summarized. So basically, in the second chapter, the whole Gita is summarized. If you want to remember the second chapter, you can remember it just by the word Gita. G stands for Guru. Because the first thing that happens in the second chapter is that Arjun approaches Krishna and what does Arjun say? Karpanya dosho pahatasva bhava I'm confused. Shishya steham sadhimam tvam prapannam Krishna, you please become my guru. guru. So the beginning of spiritual life is that you can never understand anything about spiritual life unless you first go to a guru. Therefore, Rupa Goswami, he says in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Ado Guru Padashraya. In the beginning, you must take shelter of someone who knows the science. And by their uh, association, Krishna Bhakti Janma Mula Hoya Sadhu Sang. The, uh, the Janma Mula, the root cause of the birth of devotion, is the association of those who know. So, G stands for? Guru. Guru. So, Krishna is approached by Arjun. Krishna is smiling. He's still looking at Arjun. He's like, are you sure you want me to be a guru? Like, we're just, like, I'm your charioteer. Now you're asking me to be your guru? Arjun says, no, no, I know you know Krishna. So, you please, let's do a role reversal. Usually, I should be giving you the orders. You're the chariot driver. 
But now I'm asking, let's do a role reversal. You give me the orders. It's a very, very important point. Being close to Krishna doesn't mean your problems will be solved. Arjun was close to Krishna. He was sitting right next to Krishna. But Arjun said, I'm confused. I'm bewildered. I'm depressed. I have no idea what I should do with my life. How can it be true? He's sitting right next to Krishna. Being close to Krishna doesn't solve your problems. Being close to Krishna is advantageous if you do what? Inquire, hear from Krishna. In the first chapter, Arjun was close to Krishna, but he didn't hear from Krishna. And therefore, he was still bewildered. But in the next 17 chapters, he heard from Krishna. And therefore, Nasta Moha Shmrite Labha Tvat Prasadat Maya Chuta My illusion is gone. This is a very important point because many people are close to Krishna by tradition. Many people are close to Krishna by culture. Many people <coughs> grew up with Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharat, Ramayan right there on the bookshelf. But being close to Krishna isn't enough. You have to hear from Krishna. And therefore many, many people who grow up in Vedic culture, they make this mistake. They think, no, no, Krishna, I'm close. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are close. That's very good. But now you must hear. So G stands for Guru. And then when you uh, approach Guru, then what is the first thing the Guru teaches you? What is the first thing that Krishna taught Arjun? Atma Gyan. I stands for identity. Therefore, the whole next part of the second chapter is all about identity because Krishna is explaining to Arjun, Najayate, Miyate, Vakadachin, Nayam Bhutva, Bhavita Vana Bhuyaha. The soul is neither born uh, nor does it ever die at any time. It's eternal, unborn, ever existing, primeval. It is not slain when the body is slain. So Arjun's listening patiently. And then Krishna says, Now you know that you're a soul. This means T. Two dharmas. Everyone in this world has two dharmas. You have a svadharma, which is your duty in this world because you have this body and mind. But simultaneously to that, you have a sanatan dharma, which is your duty as a soul. And therefore, Krishna says to Arjun that now understand, Arjun, that you have two duties, you have two dharmas, you have two journeys you have to go on in your life. To fulfill your obligations here, but to always remember you're on a bigger journey. And then Krishna in the final part of the chapter explains A. What does A stand for? Atma Ram. Krishna says to Arjun that if you follow your two duties perfectly, you become a Atma Ram. Which means one who is a self-realized soul, one who gains happiness from within. And therefore, in this last section of the chapter, Krishna is explaining what are the characteristics of a stita pragya, a self-realized soul. Apparently, it's said that Gandhi, this last part of the second chapter, Gandhi used to uh, recite these last verses of the second chapter every single day, stita pragya verses, the characteristics of a self-realized soul. So, now you know why the second chapter is Gita, contents of the Gita summarized. Because it tells you the journey of spiritual life from the beginning to the middle to the end. Therefore, it summarizes the whole journey of the Gita. So now, Krishna is going to tell Arjun that these are some of the characteristics of a self-realized soul. And today we're reading from text number 70 which gives a very interesting characteristic of a self-realized soul. You want to hear? Okay. So I'll read the Sanskrit. Um, I think many of you will know the verse, so I'll read one line and then you can repeat. 
Apuryamanam Machala Pratistam Apuryamanam Machala Pratistam Samudramapa Pravishanti Yadvar Samudramapa Pravishanti Yadvar Tadvat Kamayam Pravishanti Sharve Pravishanti Sharve Shashanti Mapnoti Nakama Kami Shashanti Mapnoti Nakama Kami Okay, so this is the translation. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter, into the o- la- that enter like rivers into the ocean which is ever being filled but is always still can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. I'll read the purple. Although the vast ocean is always filled with water, it is always, especially during the rainy season, being filled with much more water. But the ocean remains the same, steady. It is not agitated, nor does it cross beyond the limit of its brink. That is also true of a person fixed in Krishna consciousness. As long as one has the material body, The demands of the body for sense gratification will continue. The devotee, however, is not disturbed by such desires because of his fullness. A Krishna conscious man is not in need of anything because the Lord fulfills all his material necessities. Therefore, he is like the ocean, always full in himself. Desires may come to him like the waters of the rivers that flow into the ocean, but he is steady in his activities and he is not even slightly disturbed by desires for sense gratification. That is the proof of a Krishna conscious man, one who has lost all inclinations for material sense gratification, although the desires are present. Because he remains satisfied in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, he can remain steady like the ocean and therefore enjoy full peace. Others, however, who want to fulfill desires even up to the limit of liberation, what to speak of material success, never attain peace. The fruitive workers, the salvationists and also the yogis who are after mystic powers are all unhappy because of unfulfilled desires. But the person in Krishna consciousness is happy in the service of the Lord and he has no desires to be fulfilled. In fact, he does not even desire liberation from the so-called material bondage. The devotees of Krishna have no material desires and therefore they are in perfect peace. Srila Prabhupada ki Omagyanati Nirandha Sigyanan Jana Shalakaya Chakshodan Militam Yena Tasmai Shigurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare What is the first instruction that Krishna gives Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita? What do you think? All of you have read the Gita, I'm sure. Emil? You or no Christian will never die. Yes, that is the first piece of information. Uh-huh. But what is the first instruction? Fight. To fight? Mm-hmm. Not the first one. He definitely says fight, <laughs> but not the first one. Listen? Listen? No, Gorni, I know Gornitai knows. Well, he tells him not to lament. But okay, not to lament. 
Yes, but that's not the first one. He chastises him, yeah, but that's not an instruction. What does he, uh, what's the first instruction? No. <laughs> yep, show me. Uh, that's in chapter 4. It gives a few instructions before that. Yeah, but that's, Ar that's Arjun giving Krishna an instruction. <laughs> because Arjun says, Sena yo rubayo madhye ratam sta payame chuta o achuta Krishna, take my chariot to the middle of the battlefield. But what's the first instruction that Krishna gives to Arjun in the beginning of the Gita? It's very important. Look into. Uh, yeah, but it's not really an instruction. Not really, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, that comes later. But he says something first. The very first, I'm looking for the very first instruction. Go on. Yeah, but that, there's one even before that. <laughs> If you look at the Gita, Krishna starts uh, responding to Arjun in text number 11 and he tells Arjun, um, don't, don't, lament. don't lament. But the first major instruction that Krishna gives, one way to look at it, is in 14, where he tells Arjun a very, very important thing. What does he say? Tolerate. Tolerate. That's the first, you can say, major thing. When he tells Arjun not to lament, he's just telling him, like, calm down. It's, it's, it is an instruction, but it's the first major thing that Krishna is telling him in terms of a philosophical instruction is that you have to learn to tolerate. You see, so many things in this world, we make it ten times worse because we don't know the art of tolerance. Nowadays, whenever something is wrong or there's some problem or there's some difficulty, people don't know the art of how to tolerate. And therefore, what they do is they feel the need to immediately do something about it. A tip for you, if you ever go to India and there's a leech, have you ever been bitten by a leech? Sometimes a leech, what it does is it comes onto your hand and then what it does is it digs into your skin to suck the blood. Now once it's dug in, what do you do at that point when it really hurts? Pull it off? If you pull it off at that point, you're going to make the whole situation ten times worse because the... I've gone in. Therefore, you have to accept now. It's there. Let me just tolerate. And then once it takes its fangs out, then you can take it off. Many things in life, you have to learn this art to tolerate it. Because if you try to solve it, if you try to change it, if you try to fulfill it, you will actually get yourself into ten times more problems. Therefore, Krishna is saying to Arjun, don't feel the need, don't feel impelled to always respond to the stimulus of this world. Learn the art of tolerance. We have to tolerate nature because one type of miseries comes from nature. We have to tolerate other people because sometimes you may have experienced misery comes from other people. But actually, the main thing we have to tolerate is our own mind. That's actually the biggest source of disturbance. In the 11th canto, there's a Brahmana, and he looked at his life, and he was wondering, like, I suffered so much. And then after 
thinking all about it, he realized why he suffered so much in his life. And he says in a very beautiful verse, Nayam jano me sukhadu kahetur na devat atma griha karma kalaha mana param karma mananti samsara chakram parivarta yadyat. He said, I looked back in my life and I was wondering why did I suffer? And he said, I came to the conclusion, Nayam jano, I used to think other people were the cause of my suffering. I was wrong. Na deva tatma. Later on I thought maybe the devas were against me. They were causing my suffering. I was wrong. Graha. Later on I thought it was the alignment of the planets. Prabhu, your astrology is very bad. I was wrong. Karma. Later on I thought the cause of my suffering was my karma. I was wrong. Kala, later on I thought the cause of my suffering was time because in time everyone suffers. I was wrong. He said, none of this is the cause of my suffering. There's only one cause of my own suffering. And what's that? Mana, Param, Karanam, Amananti, the Param Karanam, the ultimate cause, the root cause, the original cause, is my own mind. Samsara chakram parivarta yad And because of that mind, my cycle in this uh, samsara is perpetuating. And so Krishna says to Arjun, you have to learn to tolerate the mind. And here Krishna is saying to Arjun, so many desires will come. And if you feel like you need to satisfy every single desire, if you feel like you need to act on every single desire, if you feel like you need to pursue every single desire, then you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble. Some desires just have to be ignored. Some desires have to be followed but in a very regulated way. And some desires have to be transformed and made spiritual. And in this way, we have to learn the art of how to manage our own desires. Otherwise, your desires will burn you up. Even Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. He says to Arjun, Kama rupena konteya dushpurena nalena cha. Karma or lust or desires, they burn like fire. If you put ghee into a fire, it may initially go down, but the net result is it then comes up to a bigger degree. And that's what happens when you try to satisfy material desires. You think, okay, now I've satisfied the desire, I've got it out of my system. But then what happens, it comes back in an even bigger way. Therefore, some desires, you have to learn how to manage desires. And in this world, people don't know how to manage their desires. They've become overcome by their own desires in their mind. Therefore, one of the biggest things in the world today is the 12-step program. You know about this? Mm -hmm. People have addictions. They're addicted to gambling or they're addicted to... Um, illicit material or they're addicted, uh, addicted to uh, intoxication, uh, addicted to so many things, addicted to their phone um, and therefore recovery. In the next 10 years you'll actually see that recovery for people who have addictions will become one of the most lucrative businesses in the world. Because factually everyone is falling into the same gap, the same trap, which is that they don't know how to manage their own desires. We have to learn to tolerate. I, I recognize this when I go, went to Vrindavan. Like uh, I used to go to Vrindavan and what I, what I did is in my first year I decided to go in January. And when I, before I went, someone said to me, no, no, don't go in January, it's very cold in Vrindavan. 
I was just like, I was like, I've been on the marathon in London for the whole month of December for 12 hours a day on the street in the freezing cold. I'm sure it's not going to be colder than that. So I was like, relax, I'm, I'm a Londoner. I know how to deal with the cold. So I went to Vrindavan and it was freezing. It was so cold. Because in India, it's colder inside than it is outside. Because everything is marble, there's no heating, and it's just like oftentimes the rooms don't even have windows, so no light comes in and there's no source of heat. It's just like this, co and in Vrindavan in the early mornings in the winter, it's just completely misty, cloudy. So it's this kind of dry type of cold. It goes into your bones. So it was so cold. <laughs> so then the next year I went in January. What I did is in my, uh, in my suitcase, I packed three heaters. And so I got to Vrindavan, I was like, I'm equipped this time, everything is going to be great. So I put in the first heater, and within 30 minutes, the coil burnt out, because there was a surge of energy. And then I, that one just broke apart. And then I put another heater out, and I basically tripped all the electricity in the whole building, because it was sucking too much. <laughs> and then I had this third heater in my bag, and I thought, no, no. <laughs> just tolerate <laughs> just tolerate and, and then I looked around in Vrindavan and I saw actually that actually in Vrindavan people had learned the art of how to tolerate our kind of our kind of approach to life is that whenever there's a problem try and solve it in this world, we're, never, we're not really taught how to live with problems, how to tolerate problems, how to just be calm in the chaos. We're always trying to find a solution. But in the material world, actually, there is no solution. The idea in the material world is we have to elevate our consciousness beyond the problem. That's the only solution to the problem. And so Krishna is telling Arjun, don't think that by satisfying all your desires, you're going to get rid of your desires. Actually, what you have to do is you have to transcend your desires by reposing your desires in something higher. And that's how you're ultimately all going to overcome this um, lust that is within the heart. That doesn't mean that sometimes we don't pursue some of our desires. We do, but we do it in a very regulated way. And we realize that that fulfillment of the desire is not what's actually going to give me the ultimate solution. The fulfillment of that desire is just going to make me peaceful. And the ultimate solution is that I got to raise my consciousness. And so here in this verse, Krishna is telling Arjun that uh, be like the ocean. So many ideas, so many thoughts, desires, plans will come into your mind. But realize that sometimes you just have to tolerate many things. And in this way, uh, don't become uh, overwhelmed by everything. Because if you try and satisfy every desire, your life will become incredibly complex. And uh, in that complexity, you will miss the real aim of life. Like that. Hare Krishna. I could speak more, but let me just stop there and see whether anyone uh, may have any questions or any comments or any reflections. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it, is it about just tolerating and then we're never making any progress? We're, that we're not making any progress. We're never making any progress. I mean, we live in, in, in society today. It's a very, you know, look at all the progress we have made over the last generation. <laughs> <laughs> So look at all the advancement of civilization. If we just tolerated the world, if we tolerated problems, then we wouldn't have all these wonderful inventions which have made life so much better. Um, so why should we tolerate? We should try and make solutions. My question to you is how many solutions have we made? 
Did you know that the average speed of travel in London was faster at the time of horse and carriage than it is now? Uh, no, no, but we've made progress. Really? Basically, what happens in the world is that there are artificial problems, there are problems, and what we do to solve that problem is we create artificial solutions, and what the artificial solutions do is they create more artificial problems which accentuate the original problem. And this is basically the cycle of life. And therefore, when we actually look, of course, now we're living in this world, we're living with this technology, so we utilize it. But is it actually advancement? Is it actually progress? Are people actually becoming happier? Isn't it that 13-year-old girl, she wrote a beautiful poem called The Paradox of the Modern World. She said, we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. We have wider highways, but narrower minds. We have more degrees but less sense. We have more wealth, but less health. We've increased our possessions, but we've reduced our values. We've conquered outer space, but we're struggling with inner space. So, some things have been created as solutions, but those things, even they are not solutions, because all of those solutions, they break down. So what we're doing as devotees is, yes, we're utilizing some of the solutions of the modern world. We're utilizing some of the facilities and conveniences. But we're doing that just to make our mind somewhat more steady. We realize that is not the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is from that steadiness of mind and steadiness of lifestyle we then absorb ourselves in higher consciousness and transcend problems. So there's no, you can't, they, Einstein, he said, you can't solve problems with the same type of thinking that created them. So you can't solve material problems with material solutions because it's the same type of thinking. You'll just increase the problem even more. Therefore, you can only solve problems on the material level through spiritual solutions. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I would like to ask, because when it comes to controlling or tolerating our own desires, that's one thing. But many of us, we find ourselves in a situation in a network, where we yeah. have to deal with network relationships. So, for example, so many of the parents they have to deal with the desires of, of their the children. children. A partner may have to deal with the desires of the spouse. So we can tolerate our own desires, but how do we tolerate and deal with unreasonable, de unreasonable desires of those who are close to us? Or not, let me not say unreasonable, but spiritual. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> We might be okay tolerating desires, but then we are intertwined in our life with others who have a lot of desires. So how do we deal with that? The first thing is, everyone in this world is flying solo. Srila Prabhupada said, at the end of the day, everyone has to fly their own plane. So one thing we should realize is that we are in a network of relationships in this world, but ultimately I have to fly my plane. So the starting point for a devotee is to create a very strong sacred space and a very strong spiritual consciousness in their own life. Right? You have to... Uh, you can't help anyone else, you can't serve anyone else, you can't walk on the journey with anyone else unless you yourself are strong. So the first thing is, when we're talking about, enter, as soon as we enter into many relationships, we should understand the more you enter into the relationships, the more you should be strong in your own spiritual life. Because otherwise you'll be affected by them and also you won't be able to help them. 
So this is the first and most important golden rule that as you enter into more relationships, ensure that you are steadier and stronger in your own spiritual journey. Therefore, uh, they recommend even before someone gets married, why do you spend time as a brahmachari? Because that solitude, that training, that foundation helps you to build an inner uh, resilience so that when you enter a network of relationships, you still are able to stay inside your own sacred space. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, relationships always mean some level of compromise. So it's not everything that I want or everything that you want. We try to compromise and we try to find a way in which we can take those desires which are strong within that person and then tailor them and address them and direct them in such a way that they won't detract from our spiritual journey but rather they can contribute to our spiritual journey. So we have to learn the art of how to redirect desires or how to manage desires um, so that they won't be a distraction. And then the ultimate third thing that we have to do is just in our relationships inspire everyone to go deeper in hearing and chanting because the only real way to help people to transcend their complex network of desires is by them getting a higher taste. And therefore even if someone has so many complicated desires that you feel now that you have to fulfill Try as much as you can to spiritually inspire each other and be absorbed together so that eventually, you know, the realization will come that actually I don't need to, uh, I don't need all these things, you know. So just in summary, number one, first be strong in your own journey. Remember, you are on your own journey. When all is said and done, you can't, you, it's going to be you at the time of death and even your family or no one you can take with you. So you have to be prepared for that journey and then um, compromise and redirect. Mm. Do you want to respond to that before I go to... Yes, I, no, that that. I do think in that connection, that communication is the goal, is the... Important, to yes. To overcome this uh, seemingly difficulties because um, in a relationship, being a Madhuri in a female form, I know that the, when the men, they go into the hay, uh, <laughs> the ladies, they get hysterical, afraid. Where is my husband disappearing? Um, because somehow in a relationship, you... You want to have affection as a female, love and affection. And if your partner suddenly seems gone from your sphere, then you tend to become afraid, where is he? What happened? Or where is he gone? But actually, if you just explain that uh, I have this need and, and to make us strong as a family, then, then I will come back more stronger to take care of you and, and everyone else like this. So I think many times these problems may arise just because we uh, don't communicate. are afraid of communicating our desires or our needs. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yes. I just have a comment. When I want to say about the lesson, especially when it was correlated, it's a uh, one time I have real hard situation from a big problem and then I was in desperation and I called my father and I felt the problem and he said uh, so many very very important and connected with this lesson he said to me Tony if you have a big problem thank you if you don't have solution if you don't have solution they have solution then don't worry but No, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. That, that yeah. is connected with the problem. That's what yeah. I reflect in my life. And it was big. It's a small menu, but it's a sentence in my life to learn how to relate with the situation. They 
tough situation and don't get emotional. It says, slow down, thinking with mind, yeah. and know which emotion you're feeling. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, some problems can be solved. Some problems will never be solved. Actually, there's in Christianity they have a serenity prayer. No, mm. it says uh, something like, "God." Uh, how do you say it? Like, uh, God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Yeah, Wisdom God, give me the ser serenity so that I can change those things in my control. That I can accept those things that are not in my control. And that I can have the wisdom to know the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just slightly away from the tolerate uh, yeah, the topic. I want to go back to the G, the Guru. Guru, yes. Yeah. Can you please uh, um, give us some idea like um, your own experience you had with your uh, Kadamba Kannan Guru, which can be inspiration for so many kids over here. Because Guru is the, the first gateway for any spiritual or any higher taste. So what, inspi what kind of um, like, um, taste the Guru introduced you? How you are so much inspired? How can we get that rasa actually so that we can elevate ourselves to the next in our journey? So what does a guru, how does a guru help you in your life and, and what does a guru give you? I'll tell you one, uh, one interaction I had with Maharaj and through this. So Maharaj, as we know, he got diagnosed with cancer uh, last year. Um, and then he decided when he knew he had cancer that no, now there's no treatment, just tolerate. No solution now. The only solution is we have to go in. We have to focus on Krishna. So then he decided to go to Vrindavan. So in Kartik, I went to see him in Vrindavan. So he said, you come and you stay and we'll stay together. So he was very kind to me. So I was staying in the room next to him. So uh, he had made all arrangements and he was very, very kind. He had... Um, he had welcomed us very nicely. And then one day he came into my room and my danda was there. So, <laughs> so he came into my room, so he was just walking around and he, uh, he picked up my danda. So he picked up my danda and he looked at me and he said, this is so heavy. Basically, we have two types. One danda is the original danda that we got at initiation, but then we carry a travel danda, which collapses. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving all the secrets. It's like, so you know like you have a snooker cue? It's like that. So because there's metal pieces inside, it was very heavy. So he picked up my danda. He said, this is so heavy. So I was laughing. I was saying, yeah, I mean, I thought, that were we supposed to carry a danda? So then he said, come with me. So then I walked into his room. And then there next to his bed was his danda. So he said, uh, he said, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to his danda. And I picked up his danda and his danda was so light. It was like a feather. So... He looked at me, he was smiling. He said, what do you think? <laughs> I said, marriage is so light. He said, and yours is so heavy. He said, you like it? I said, yeah, it's so light. It's he said, you can have it. So he gave me that danda. And then, uh, then later on, I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, that's actually what a guru does. Something that's very, very heavy, he makes it very, very light. Something that's very, very difficult, he makes it very, very easy. Something that you think is so far away that I'll never reach it, he makes it attainable. So the guru is basically that person who makes spiritual life practical, 
real, achievable, and that person who gives you the inspiration and confidence that you can do it in your life. You see, we may read Shastra, but simply by reading Shastra and these high ideals, it's very difficult for us to think like, but how will I ever get there? But when you contact a spiritual teacher, one who knows you, one who loves you, one who has the spiritual advancement to be able to help you, then what they will do is they will give you the step-by-step -step guidance to make that which seems very, very difficult achievable and within your grasp. And so, uh, therefore it said, Mukham karoti vachalam pangam langhayate girim yad kripatamaham vande shri gurum dinatarinam by the grace of a guru, a lame person can cross mountains, a dumb person can speak very eloquently, and one who is blind is able to see stars in the sky. Because the guru basically bridges the gap between where we are and where we want to be, and the guru bridges that gap. Does that make sense? Someone else? I saw another hand. Oh, yes, okay. Atma Ram. Atma means the soul and Ram means pleasure. So, one who literally is self realized is known as an Atma Ram. Uh, they derive pleasure from within because they are connected with the Supreme. So the final part of chapter 2 is describing the characteristics of someone who's finding that inner happiness, that inner connection. Arjun says, how will I know who's an Atma Ram? How do they walk? How do they talk? How do they respond to the challenges of life? And in this way, Krishna explains all the characteristics of a self-realized soul. somebody has a desire and you say that you know we need to uh, overcome this desire but do you feel that uh, sometimes it may be artificial at that moment <coughs> I want to actually fulfill that desire and if I, if I try to let's say hide it or, or you know uh, you know move try to maybe I'm focusing on trying to focus on a higher goal but that's not actually my goal right now yeah and it feels uh, I'm, I, I feel you know like I'm, I, my heart is not there and so what do you think okay <laughs> imagine you go to the market and you get an apple that you want to offer to Krishna then the apple basically has different parts. There are some part of the apple that you just need to cut out. You can't offer that to Krishna. There are other parts of the apple which are kind of slightly dirty, but if you wash them, then you can be offered to Krishna. And there are other parts of the apple which are just fresh and can be offered to Krishna. So your desires are like this. There are some desires which just cannot be entertained within spiritual life because they'll take you away from Krishna. Like, uh, yeah, for example, you know, yeah, and so many things. For example, the four regulative principles. We can't violate those things. I say, well, can, can I do like three and a half or two and a half, like, can I engage the other one and a half in a Krishna conscious way? No. Some things are just going to take you away. So some desires have to be ignored. Other desires, they can be washed. They can be dovetailed. They can be turned in such a way that although it seemingly is like a material desire, but it can be engaged in such a way that it will take you to Krishna. And other desires are just good, positive desires that will uh, blossom your spirituality. And those should be wholeheartedly um, embraced. So some desires have to be ignored. 
Some desires have to be dovetailed and other desires have to be embraced. And we have to know the difference between them and how to appropriately respond to each desire. The problem is the desires which need to be ignored are the ones we embrace. And the ones which we need to embrace are the ones we ignore. And the ones which, you know, need to be purified, you know, like, so we don't get it right. So we have to understand. And that's why spiritual teachers are so important. Because they can, uh, they can help us distinguish. Ignore this, dovetail this, and fully follow this. And they can give us, help us to understand what's the difference. Does that make sense? Okay, any fine, yes. You see, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, um, the whole last section of the Bhagavad Gita, the final six chapters, are all about Jnana Yoga. And Jnana Yoga, in essence, is about detachment, about letting go. In the life of, uh, in the spiritual journey, learning to let go of things is very important. There are certain attitudes that we have to let go of. There are certain um, mindsets that we need to let go of. There are certain desires that we need to let go of. And there are also certain relationships that we need to let go of. Sometimes we can get into a relationship where we feel obliged or where we feel um, uh, indebted or we feel like we have some responsibility and therefore we're not able to walk away from that relationship but in essence what's happening in that relationship is it's not doing any good for you neither is doing any good for that person but we're simply staying together out of some kind of obligation or expectation or because of fear of uh, what we'll do if we leave this relationship but we need to overcome those fears. We need to overcome those uh, blocks because certain relationships are just not serving us in our life. And therefore, uh, they say, like for example, there's a famous saying, the art of conversation is not just to say the right thing at the right time, but to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. So the art of conversation is not just to say the right thing at the right time, but to be aware to not say the thing you really want to say at the wrong time. Both are just as important. So in spiritual life, it's not just important the positive relationships that we have in our life which give us inspiration, but it's also just as important to leave behind the relationships which are sucking energy. The relationships which are making us negative or making us... Uh, and we have to know how to do that in an appropriate way without offending, without discouraging, without being um, uh, insensitive to others. But there are some things we just have to walk away from and we have to be able to do that. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. I just want to add that the the question is that how does the soul who decides so much of corporate things come in that kind of time? Yeah. And so how does that go together with where if you let go of relationships it's like a toxic or that's not very much favorable for our development? But it's quite so much to say Yeah, the highest ideal is if we can cooperate with each other because Srila Prabhupada said that your love for me will be shown by how much you cooperate together.
But the reality is sometimes we're not on that level of advancement. We're not on that level of transcendence and we're still feeling heavy emotions with other people. In that situation, if we're not able to actively cooperate with someone, then what we should do is create some safe distance. But what we have to make sure is that we don't become an obstacle to each other. What often happens is when people decide that they can't cooperate together, then they automatically by default become enemies to each other. But there is another way you can do it whereby you say, if at this moment we can't cooperate together because there's too much negativity, then let's keep a safe distance, let's pray for each other, and uh, let's not obstruct each other or fight with each other. And as long as we do that, then it's not against the development of pure devotional service. But the moment we stop cooperating and we then by default start fighting, then it becomes uh, a problem. Does that make sense? Therefore, even Srila Prabhupada, sometimes if devotees weren't getting along, then what he would do is he would just take one devotee and he would say, you go to this town and start a center there. <laughs> so at least, uh, because if they would stay in the same place, they would become an obstacle to each other. So we should just find some other engagement and wish that person well and try not to hold feelings of negativity and just get on with the real business. Ego death, yeah. So ego death is this kind of concept that we're identifying ourselves through different things. And when those things disappear, then we lose our sense of identity. So say, for example, if someone is holding a position with it within ISKCON, and then one they identify with that position so much and then tomorrow they lose that position it's like ego death like their sense of identity has just died because they were fully investing it in that relationship so you're saying if you have a relationship with a spiritual master which you so much identify with and then the spiritual master leaves does that create an ego death Oh, okay. So when you get close to a spiritual person, is there a sense that, a fear that you're losing your material identity? Yeah, maybe. But there's also an excitement that you're developing a spiritual identity. Therefore, yes, coming to Krishna consciousness, you have to be brave. You have to be courageous. You have to be bold. Because you're walking away from so many things. But why do we do it? Because there's simultaneously excitement. There's simultaneously an adventure. There's a hunger that was, what am I going to achieve on the other side? So yeah, to practice Krishna consciousness, you have to be brave. Because you have to walk away from many things. But it's not a death. It's the beginning of real life. You have to die to live. Kill the material identity to really live in the spiritual identity. But it's also like when the condition comes in the first place. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why you need association, and that's why you know it's a step by step process. You don't just immediately extricate yourself from the material world. But it's a process of elevation of consciousness. Like it's interesting, when you do a deity worship, you do something called uh, Bhuta Shuddhi, which means a purification of all the items, but it also means a purification <coughs> of your identity. So before you actually go to do worship, 
you're supposed to do a purification of your own identity. And the verse that you're supposed to chant is this very first, very famous verse of Mahaprabhu where he says, Naham vipro na cha narapatir na pi vaisho na sudro. He says, I'm not a Vaishya, I'm not a sannyasi, I'm not a man or a woman, I'm not any of these things. I'm just a servant of the servant of the servant. So gradually what's happening is we're learning not to identify with all the roles of this world and we're learning to come in contact with who we really are, spiritual beings. So there is an ego death, there's a, there's a false ego death to give, to awaken the real ego. Yeah, therefore we try to spiritualize the relationships. So after you come to Krishna consciousness, it's not that you're not going to relate to your family anymore. Like, now I'm a spirit soul, I'm no longer your daughter. <laughs> it's like, no, we're not exactly going to do that. But you're going to be, now I'm a spirit soul, and Krishna put me in contact with you, you're my parents. So now let me relate to you, but with a spiritual dimension, with a spiritual vision. So you redefine your relationships. Does that make sense? Yes. You. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. It's not possible. <laughs> 